Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International A-Level Chemistry Unit 6 for June 2022. This is the part 1 video. I'll do the part 2 video and put the link below the discussion box. Let's begin with the first question. So here it says, a student investigates two aqueous solutions, each containing a salt. Each salt has one cation and one anion. Solution A is blue and solution B is orange. So here they've given us the information. Uh, we can see here the observation when aqueous sodium hydroxide is added. Solution A remains if there is a blue precipitate, which is insoluble in excess, sodium hydroxide. And then the observation with the nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate, we see a white precipitate in a blue solution. So formation of a white precipitate with the nitric acid and silver nitrate, it means there should be silver chloride, or a chloride at least in there. For B, they said a solution changes from orange to yellow. Anytime you see orange turn to, turn to yellow, there is a possibility that a dichromate is being converted into chromate 6. So here they say a gas is evolved on warming, which turns damp red, litmus paper blue. This gas should be ammonia, and therefore this cation should be ammonium cation. This part here confirms that the cation is ammonium cation. And on the other side, they see uh, a separate precipitate that is observed. So A1 says, Identify by name or formula the salt in A. From this information, I can see because it was a blue precipitate, which was insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide, uh, this is supposed to be copper 2 plus. And then they give us this one here, uh, which shows the silver chloride, meaning there was a chloride anion, so it should be copper 2 chloride. Moving on, they say the white precipitate is separated from the solution. Give a test on the precipitate and its positive result to confirm the identity of the anion in A. Remember we have observed the anion in A is chloride, so if we wanna, be we wanna confirm or be sure that it's actually chloride, we need to add aqueous ammonia. If you add aqueous ammonia, the white precipitate is supposed to dissolve. If it does dissolve, then that was a chloride anion present in there. You could also use sulfuric acid and utensive steamy fumes, that could be a conclusion as well, but this is more preferred, this one here. Then here they say, identify by name or formula the gas given off when B is warmed with aqueous sodium hydroxide. Of course, I've already said that gas is ammonia. And then they say, give the formulae, remember this is plural, of the ions of the salt in B. Let us go back here. Remember B had orange turned to yellow. It means the anion was a dichromate. And it turned, it produced a gas that turned up red litmus paper blue. It means it had ammonium cation, so the salt should be ammonium dichromate, as you can see here. So ammonium and then a dichromate. This brings us to the end of question one. I will go to question two. Question two. A student is asked to identify three colorless liquids labeled C, D, and E. The compounds are all non-cyclic isomers with a formula carbon 5, hydrogen 10, oxygen 1. The student carries out three tests on separate samples of each compound. They want us to complete table 1 to show the observations that the student makes. So the samples here are C, D, and E, and the reagents used are we see Brady's reagent, failing or Benedict solution. We have the iodoform test, iodine in sodium hydroxide, and then they've given us the functional groups. We can see that C is actually a ketone. We can see that D has a secondary alcohol, and we can see that E is an aldehyde. So this and that should give a positive test with Brady's reagent because both of them are carbonyl compounds. So C is a carbonyl. We can see the orange precipitate forms shows it's a carbonyl. And because this is a ketone, it should have no observable change with fillings or Benedict solution because this is only done by carbonyls, uh, by uh, uh, aldehydes among the carbonyl compounds. And then iodine with sodium hydroxide here, of course, because this has a terminal methyl group, I want to show you how a terminal methyl group looks like. So this one here is a, it's a methyl group at the end that is attached to a carbonyl carbon. So that is what we call a terminal methyl group in this case. So here, because this has that group, it should be able to give a positive test with iodine and sodium hydroxide. And that positive test is yellow precipitate. Uh, yellow precipitates are going to form, or you could say an antiseptic smell is going to be evolved. Now for D, we can observe here that this is a secondary alcohol. Secondary alcohols will not give a positive test with a Brady's reagent because they are not carbonyls. And they will not give a positive test with Felling's reagent because 
Of course, there will not be oxidized using that. And then we can see that another group that can give a positive test with this is uh, if it has something like this. Uh, let me correct this one here. If it has an OH group and there is a methyl group here and then something like that. Usually it could be a secondary alcohol or it could be even ethanol. They could give a test uh, with this one here because the iodine is going to cause the oxidation and then they will produce a ketone which is going to be able to give a positive test with this re reagent. So this one here, the pale yellow precipitate with antiseptic smell is going to be absorbed. So moving on to E. E here is an aldehyde, so it should give a positive test with Bridie's reagent, that is okay. And because it's an aldehyde, it also gives a positive test with this. So the brick red precipitate is going to be formed. And uh, because it has no terminal methyl group, we can see there was no observable change with the iodine in the presence of sodium hydroxide. So that is how you would fill the table. Moving on, they say identify by NEMO formula the pale yellow precipitate that forms when iodine and sodium hydroxide are added to sample D. Remember, they want us to find the name or write the name of formula. When you add iodine uh, with sodium hydroxide to sample D, remember D here is a secondary alcohol, we are going to observe a product called triiodomethane, or you could write it like that. So that's it. Let's move on. Here they say the orange precipitates produced on the addition of Bridie's reagent to sample C and E are called derivatives. The melting temperatures of derivatives are used to confirm the identity of compounds. Solids are recrystallized so that their melting temperatures may be determined accurately. Describe in, un in outline the procedure for the recrystallization of a solid. If you want to carry out recrystallization, you begin by dissolving the solids or the precipitates in minimum amount of hard solvent. We use a hard solvent so that we do not use more. We, we, the hard solvent is going to ensure that they dissolve faster so that we do not use excess amount. And then after everything has dissolved, or after at least we have added the required amount of, of uh, the solvent to dissolve, filter out to ensure that any insoluble impurities are removed. So you filter when hot to remove any insoluble impurities. And then you will allow the resultant solution to cool down so that the crystals begin to form. When all the crystals are formed, filter the crystals under reduced pressure. This ensures that the solvent is removed. And as you do that, you wash with minimum amount of cold solvent to ensure that any soluble impurities are removed as well. And finally, you could find a, use a suitable method of drying. You could use a desiccator, you could use with filter paper, or you could use a low heat oven in order to obtain uh, the crystals you are looking for. So that's it. Let's continue. Here they say the melting temperatures of the derivatives of the reaction of Bridie's reagent with some aldehydes and ketones are shown. So we have the information here in this table. They're going to ask the melting temperature of the recrystallized derivatives of sample C is found to be between 138 to 140. Suggest the identity of the compound C and justify your answer using the information at the start of the question and the data in the table 1 and 2. I want us to go back to the table at the start of the question. We observe that C is a ketone and it should have a terminal methyl group. That is what we saw here. So I want, to, I want us to go back and see if it is a ketone, it should be able to produce a specific, uh, specific crystals. Now it means it cannot be an aldehyde. These ones here, this is an aldehyde and that is an aldehyde. So these two are aldehydes, they are already ruled out. Remember the product should be a ketone. Uh, it should be from a ketone. And then when we look at these, remember the melting temperature is between here. This one here is too high, so that is also ruled out. And remember at the beginning of the question, they said if they are non-cyclic compounds, this one here is cyclic, that is also going to be rolled out. So the only thing that remains is this one. And actually, its melting temperature is closer to the range that we are given. So it's the, uh, we can take that to be the answer. So I chose, I said C is pentan to on. Uh, I gave my reasons here from the table. C is a ketone with a terminal methyl group. So it cannot be 3 methyl butanol or it cannot be 2 ether butanol. These are aldehydes. And the C is non-cyclic, so it cannot be cyclopentanone. And C is not pentan 3 on because the given melting temperature is way higher than the measured one. So for these reasons, you could be able to get the two marks. Moving on. Here they say the high-resolution proton NMR spectrum of E is shown. So here we have the spectrum here. And they say the relative numbers of protons responsible for the, high, for the singlet 
our peaks shown are P is equal to 1 and Q is equal to 9. It means in this area we have one proton and in that area we have a 9 proton. So 1 hydrogen, 9 hydrogens, or the ratio is 1 to 9. They say use this information and the result of the test in, uh, in A to draw the display formally of E labeling the proton environments. Remember from the beginning it was carbon 5, hydrogen 10, oxygen 1. So we have to keep this in mind. It means there is a total of 10 hydrogens, however, 9 of those are in one environment. So I began off by putting one carbon at the center and plotting th and uh, drawing three other carbons to ensure that I have taken care of the nine hydrogens that have to be in one environment. That left me with only one carbon left. And that carbon, or, uh, the other atoms I was left with was just one oxygen and one hydrogen. So to be able to fit them here, it was that and that. And I remember they said E is an aldehyde from the information we had. So this is the only possible aldehyde I could create if I had one carbon here and three other carbons this side. It was only this. So this brings us to the end of this question as well as the end of this first video of this paper. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you for being with us. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.